So I just want to welcome everybody and um, to today's information session. We're really happy uh, to have Beacon Hill staff and group. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Elise Mendel, and I am the career director at Baruch College Weissman School of Arts and Sciences graduate programs. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce right away Olivia, Sylvie, and Julia, who are from Beacon Hill Staffing Group, and they are going to uh, kick it off. And um, how, how this will work, they're going to do a presentation, and at the end of the presentation, um, I'll look at the chat box for whatever questions you have, and I'll say, you know, your questions to them. Um, so, what, you know, as you're thinking of questions, put it in the chat box, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll ask on your behalf. All right, with no further ado, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Julia. Um, I am an associate, associate consultant with Beacon Hill Staffing Group, and I work specifically on the HR team, so do my colleagues, who will um, be introduced shortly. Um, I started with Beacon Hill, um, I'm approaching my one year this summer, um, and prior to um, me joining Beacon Hill, I actually worked um, for Target in the retail stores, um, managing more of the sales, but also doing the recruitment, employee relations, um, that sort of a thing. I decided I wanted to change, and I actually went to Beacon Hill to help guide me in that change, and I ended up with the company. Um, it's been a great um, road so far. I've learned so much specifically about HR, um, but that's a little bit about me and my background, and I will turn it over to Sylvie. Okay. I'm okay. muted. Well, I'm muted. Hi, everyone. Okay. I'm Sylvie. So glad we can do this virtually. Um, I'm also an associate consultant on the HR team. I actually graduated from Virginia Tech last May. I can't believe it's almost been a year. Um, and I studied, I got my bachelor's in HR management. So I'm new to Beacon Hill and new to staffing, but it'll almost be a year and it's been a great year. So I'm really excited to be sharing some of this info with you guys today and hopefully it's helpful. I'll pass it on to Olivia. Thanks, Sylvie and Julia. Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia, and I work with, with Sylvia and Julia um, on the HR search team at Beacon Hill. I'm a senior consultant, which basically just means that I've got a little bit more experience, um, but the other two ladies here are really doing a great job, so they have a wealth of knowledge to share as well. Um, I started my career in staffing at another firm and then actually worked in HR myself for a few years um, in financial services before making the change back to staffing recruiting for HR specifically and really excited that we could be here today despite the craziness going on and still connect with you all virtually we're really excited to get started so Julia is going to kick things off and I'll send things back over to her all righty so we want to start off with a little bit about our organization and exactly what is Beacon Hill so we are um, a privately owned staffing firm. Um, we have been recognized as one, as one of the fastest growing companies within our industry. And we have about 53 locations nation, uh, nationally um, with about 1,000 employees roughly. Um, in addition to HR, we do service other sectors as well, such as finance and accounting, legal, tech, admin, pharma, and we recently just added life sciences to the sectors that we provide employment services to. Um, you know, we really pride ourselves on providing a consultative approach, not only to our uh, clients that we service and support with their searches, but to our candidates that come to us seeking um, employment as well. And so specifically for HR, so we have an HR practice here in New York City, as well as in Boston, where we are headquartered. And we focus on retained search, contingency placement as well, contract and temporary. And it's across all different functions at all levels of HR. So anything from entry level to senior level. And in terms of the functional areas that we uh, service. Uh, it could be anything from, as I mentioned, an HR coordinator to CHRO, more on that generalist path, as well as total reward, so compensation and benefits. Uh, we do also get roles with focus in talent management, so organizational develop, development and learning and development as well. Talent acquisition, both focused in lateral and campus recruiting, 
employee relations, labor relations as well, and some HRIS and operations roles, so more focus on the systems and streamlining the systems, as well as some diversity and inclusion. And so now Sylvie will kind of tell you a little bit about our process as well. I'm now gonna go over getting in touch with a recruiter at Beacon Hill. So the first step is to go ahead and apply to one of our roles on our website. That can be through LinkedIn, Career Builder, or Glassdoor, or just our own website. We try to post all of our roles um, and we try to do that in a timely manner so that they are out to the public. Um, if you qualify for any of the roles, you know, a recruiter will reach out to you as soon as possible. We, we do tend to get a lot of resumes. We try to look through them and, and we wanna reach out if you're qualified and wanna have that conversation, which is the next step. Um, it's an introductory phone call. And really it's, it's a brief call to kind of discuss your experience, your background, what you're looking for in your career. And then that last step is coordinating. Typically it's a time to meet in person. Right now it's virtual, um, where we do a more deeper dive of your resume, I'd really talk through your career aspirations and the different kind of matches we can make based on the jobs that we have. And then in terms of resumes, like I said, we see a lot of resumes every day. It's a big part of our job. So a couple of things, these are some really big tips that when we're looking at resumes, these things are, these are the resumes we want to, to look at. So first of all, it should be eye-catching but simple. So nothing crazy, you know, we always say keep it to black and white, no bold colors. Um, and following the 10 second rule, which is really, if, if someone's gonna look at your resume for 10 seconds, what are the things that they see versus the things that they might not read? You want the things that they see to be pointed out as important. Um, bolding your name, this is something that I think a lot of people forget to do or it doesn't seem quite as important, but it really does help us with remembering your name if it's in bold, right at the top of your resume in a big font. Um, of course, consistency with bullets and headings. I know some people like to put dashes or they'll write in paragraph format, but we really do think that bullets are the most like, cleanest way to put them on your resume and just have it be there. Um, it looks very professional. And then of course, the consistent tenses is a big part of this. So if, you're ha if you have a role from the past, you wanna make sure it's in the past tense. And then of course your present position in the present tense. Um, that's also a mistake and making sure that when you leave your role and go to an X, you're making those updates to your resume. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned, avoiding long paragraphs, the 10 second rule, you wanna be able to just look at it, glance and kind of know what the person's background is. Um, and then of course, having a summary statement, this can be really helpful, especially if you can use keywords and kind of describe the industry you've been in, your areas of expertise. Um, you know, it's just fact-based, a simple statement. And then you can also use an objective statement to kind of share if you're making a tra career transition, what you're looking for or what you're seeking. Um, and then lastly, something else that I think is often missed on resumes is having a brief, very brief one to two sentence overview, maybe under your title or under the company name of, you know, what did you do in that role briefly? Who did you support? What's the industry? Just so it's kind of a clear summary before they read those bullets. And then some more things about the resume, of course, highlighting your accomplishments. Um, you know, a lot of times people kind of put a grocery list on their resume. It's a total listed out and there's really no impact there, but we do think it's really helpful to provide more of the actual accomplishments, what you did, what impact you made. Um, be honest, don't mis misrepresent your experience. You know, have the correct dates, have the correct title. If, you know, you're trying to get a job in recruiting, but you've never recruited, you wanna make sure you're honest and, you know, you don't say you've done it, but again, that's where the objective statement can come in and you kind of explain that you, you want to break into that space. Um, be succinct, of course, like any professional document, um, your resume should not have way too much information, kind of just the right amount. Um, too many words, again, we might not be able to read it all. People don't always have time. That 10 second rule, going back to that. Um, and then buzzwords, maybe at your company you have outings and you have a certain nickname for them. You wanna make sure that you're using typical words that anyone reading your resume would understand. Um, and then lastly, keeping the resume to two pages. Um, of course, this is important. Um, we, we sometimes, I've seen resumes up to five pages before and there's just no way for me to get through it. And I want to, but I can't. So I think it's really important to have that two page maximum. Um, and then of course, you know, you're now in the HR space, maybe previously you had a different career. Um, you you wanna leave that stuff on your resume, but you can kind of shrink it by including maybe one or two sentences about those previous roles that you held. And then lastly, LinkedIn is so big, so important. 
I can see a lot of you. How many of you have LinkedIn? You can kind of give me like a thumbs up. Yeah, the majority. So LinkedIn is a huge part of not only getting a job, but basically just networking for life. Um, so of course, first things first, you want your resume to match your LinkedIn. I often have a resume in my hand. I go on LinkedIn. It's drastically different. You know, they have a couple things from 10 years ago or maybe an internship, but none of your work experience now. So you want to make sure that those align. Um, of course, a professional photo. This should be recognizable. It should look like you. And of course, should be something that you'd feel comfortable with your parents seeing or your colleagues and whatnot. Very professional photo. And then, you know, just like a resume, but not quite as in-depth, you do want to have a couple summaries of your roles. So again, that brief overview, one to two sentences of what you did. And then, of course, keeping it up to date. When you get promoted, add that to your LinkedIn. Um, and the last thing that's extremely important is keeping open to opportunities if you are open to opportunities. That basically enables recruiters to reach out to you and makes your profile more visible. And that way we can know that we can try to help you find a job. And that's always the goal. So next I'm gonna pass it on to Olivia. He's gonna go over interviewing. Great, thanks Sylvie. Hi again, everyone. So when we talk about interviews and when we talk about interviews with us versus at a client, there are two differences. With us, it's going to be, and by us, I mean you meet with uh, us at Beacon Hill um, in person or you know via video conference right now. Um, it is slightly more informal than it will be at a client, but you still do want to put your best foot forward um, and make sure that you know, you're being fully transparent with us. You can really, honestly, the best way for us to help you is by knowing all the details, knowing everything. Um, so always encourage candidates to be fully transparent with us. Um, and again, putting your best foot forward, making sure that you're fully prepared. Um, but before I really dive into that, let's talk about what not to do in an interview. Um, some of these are probably obvious, but when I say we've seen it all, we really have with interviews, um, both in our office and you know at our client. So just want to reiterate these things that are really important. Um, both you know in person and also on the phone and via video conference it's all important it all counts it all matters so first off chewing gum definitely not a good thing to do in an interview it's distracting it can make a noise especially on the phone if the service isn't great you can only hear the chewing probably not the best thing to do um, answering your phone or checking email especially now when we're in this kind of virtual world where we are connecting a lot of times via zoom via some sort of a video conference making sure that your cell phone is silenced your emails are silenced you're not having pinging sounds that are coming up it can be really distracting so just making sure that you close out everything and you're really set to really be focused in for your interview or your conversation. Um, of course, this is for in-person, this, this next bullet point, um, but I would just say keep it light on any cologne or perfume. Probably don't even do it. You never know who has sensitivities and you don't want that to be distracting during an interview. Um, and again, you know, loud backgrounds or interruptions while on a video. If you're preparing for a, for a video call, make sure your video works. Make sure you have a nice quiet space to do your video call in. Uh, make sure that you're appropriately dressed. Um, you know, I would say keep it simple um, for in-person and, um, and via video call. And what I mean by that is, you know, simple colors. Um, I know I'm wearing a light blue blazer right now um but i would say you know for in person um for a video call probably just keep it simple black or gray um nothing too distracting um in terms of what will give you an edge both when you meet with us and with clients i think being prepared asking questions certainly you, know, you want to distinguish distinguish yourself by making a genuine connection with the person who you're meeting with um, Asking questions that show you did your research. So looking people up on LinkedIn, that's really, really helpful. It's okay if someone gets notification that you've seen or that they've viewed your profile. It's not creepy. It shows that you're doing your research. So that's great. Um, you want to make sure that the minute you arrive at your interview, again, this is in person, um, but the minute you arrive, you're, you know, being your best self, you're being very polite to, you know, starting with security downstairs 
to whoever greets you in the office, whoever walks you back to your interview room. That applies to us too, as well as at a client. Um, so just making sure that you're being conscious of that. Also, if we're doing a video call, make sure that the moment you press connect, you're ready to go. You're not fixing your hair, you're not twirling your hair, you're not taking a, you know, a sip of water, you're not taking a selfie, you're, you're ready to go. Um, and something that I always tell candidates, we always tell candidates, it sounds so silly, but when you're especially for a video, um, excuse me, for a phone call, smile when you're talking. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something about when you smile and you talk versus if you're not smiling and you're a little serious, your voice just transcends in a different way. And that can be really valuable, especially when you can't see someone's face to make that connection. Of course, when you're in a video call or in person, you want to be engaging. You're going to smile. You're going to have eye, eye contact. So making it you know, as engaging as possible. Um, I would say with, with interview questions, you can certainly do um, preparation by just being familiar and comfortable with your own experience. So having time to reflect on your experience, okay, over the last you know, six months, the last year, the last few years, what have I been really proud of? What have the accomplishments that I've, I've done? Um, you know, what have I done that I'm really proud of and I want to talk about? What are areas of improvement that I have? When have I worked with difficult partners, perhaps? Just being really reflective so you're ready to answer those questions um, and thinking of different examples. Um, you also want to make sure that you are, you're answering the question that you're asked. So if you are asked a question, have you ever used ADP, for example, and you haven't, but you've used three other HRIS, you want to say, no, I have not used ADP, but I've used these other systems. So you're directly answering the question, you're being a good listener, but then you're also providing additional context. And being results oriented, so you're quantifying what you're saying. You're not just talking about, oh, I increased employee retention. You're having facts, you're having specific examples to cite that can really back up what you're saying. So next, we're going to move on to keeping in touch. And this applies, again, both to us as recruiters at Beacon Hill and also with anyone that you've interviewed with and also anyone you've met in a networking group um, or in an interview. Um, you want to make sure that you're keeping in touch with all those people. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Connect with people you meet on LinkedIn. Stay connected that way. Don't be afraid to check in. Seasonal changes are great excuses. Any holiday, even if it's something little like Valentine's Day or you know, yesterday was Cinco de Mayo, wish people happy Cinco de Mayo. It's an excuse to check in. Um, and it makes people know that you're still thinking about them, which is really great. And also you're not viewing the relationship as so transactional. It's more well-rounded and it's a true relationship that you're trying to build. Um, one last thing with us is, if we've submitted your resume to a client and we're working together, it's totally fine to ask us how you should stay in touch with us. We'll always be transparent with you and be proactive. If we've sent your resume to a client and our client wants to meet, we'll tell you, of course, we'll get it set up. Um, but it is fine to ask that question. So you're setting expectations accordingly. That's absolutely fine. So getting in touch, this is all of our contact information for myself, for Sylvie, for Julia, and then our website, beaconhillstaffing.com backslash job seekers and find a job. So all of our jobs are listed there. You can apply directly to them. Um, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions at all. And then lastly, this is a list of our uh, some of our, it's a nice sampling of some of our active jobs that we're working on. So as Julia mentioned in the introduction, we have such a wide range of different types of jobs that we work on, different industries and different levels of roles. So you have anything from a talent development coordinator, which some firms say talent development, other firms use learning and development. It can sometimes be the same thing, it can sometimes be different. 
in this case, it's learning and development. Um, so we have an L&D coordinator, we have a sourcing specialist, which is um, within the talent acquisition function. That's a nonprofit, the first one's with a FinTech firm. Um, we have an assessment specialist that sits within talent management. We also have a director of technology at a global tech company, a director of HR and a chemical manufacturing company. So wide scope of different types of roles that we're working on. So that just shows you know, the different types of roles that we see so we can help you know, different types of candidates. Um, as I imagine, all of you have, have unique backgrounds and interests within the HR space. So we'd love to be able to help you all. That's great. Um, thank you so much. Are, are the, the slides are done, correct? Okay. All right. The slides Good. are done. Uh, Great. Okay. So um, I'm going to kick off a question that I have, and then um, I just want to encourage anybody who has questions just to start putting them in the chat box, and I'll, I'll ask for you. But um, I was just worrying about cover letters. So when people are applying um, to you for something, um, are, do you require, require a cover letter, or does the comp your client company require a cover letter? This is for anybody. A cover letter. Um, the, sorry, Sylvie. Uh, the main reason for us to meet is so that we're able to kind of essentially submit your resume to a client with something that's similar to a cover letter, but not really, right? What's your experience? Why are you interested in this role? Or why are you interested in transitioning if you are, you know, maybe um, targeting, targeting a different function? Um, so it's not, nece it's not necessary, um, for us, I would say. All right. Um, the next question is, uh, if you have type, if you have jobs for candidates for the PhD and IO. We do work on these types of jobs. Actually the assessment specialist rule, that's the third bullet point down on the active job list. I know it says a master's, but they're also open to PhD. So yeah. Okay. Great. Um, also, would you recommend attaching a PDF portfolio when applying for a role? I just think they mean a PDF resume. Yeah, or I mean, I think it depends on what type of HR professional you are. If you're an L and D um, professional, and maybe you're making perhaps training materials, training guides, it could be helpful for us to see. It's not necessary. I think it just depends on what the, if it's you know, what the client asks for, because on some websites, if you're applying to a client directly, they might say, please submit work samples. If they don't, I don't think it could be a bad thing necessarily, but I don't know if it is necessary. I would just follow whatever instructions that they have. You can absolutely share that with us and wherever it's appropriate, we can share with our clients. Hope that answers the question. Well, so maybe when someone, so let's say someone's applying for the assessment specialist position, they, when they, they're gonna go online and apply for it, and then you're gonna get the resume, then you're gonna meet with that candidate and this is determine whether it's a good fit or not. And then you send it on to your client in terms of the company, and then they decide if they want to interview the person. Is that kind of storyline exactly. there? Exactly, yes. Okay. And we'll only send candidates' resumes to clients um, when we've talked to the candidate about that specific role and the, the candidate has expressed interest in that position. So we won't okay. just send your resume without your consent because that would be silly and a waste of everyone's time, honestly. All right. <laughs> All right. So, and uh, the next question, how would a recent graduate in IO get their resume noticed, especially when they don't have the necessary experience, you know, in the IO field? Yeah, so I think this isn't necessarily so much IO specific, but getting a resume noticed when you're applying to a role that you might not have the experience for, I think it's good to think about anything you've done relative to that, any various experiences, maybe in an organization with school or something. Um, but of course, the resume things we went over in terms of keeping things succinct, make, showing the impact that you've made, 
I think that can be really helpful too to make sure your resume is following those guidelines. And then you can have an objective statement that does state what you're looking for, why you might be qualified for that and what not to kind of have that at the forefront of your resume. And, and, and kind of along the same line, um, so is there any additional advice you would give to somebody who's trying to break into the IO field? Um, you know, I think thinking about, again, anything you, anything in your experience that could relate, or maybe you were a part of different organizations or you have a leadership role or anything related to IO, I think would be useful. You really, I mean, if, if you, you want to break into the IO space, you want to make sure your resume reads that very clearly. Um, so, you know, maybe if you've had various roles, eliminating or shrinking those things, not eliminating, but shrinking them um, to kind of emphasize IO specific things. And I just would add to that, um, I, I recommend to uh, graduate students to put their education on top where it says, you know, master uh, in industrial organizational psychology, current candidate, and then relevant courses, because then all those course names have those keywords in it. Uh, and it also shows that that's, you know, where they're, what they're studying, as well as what you're saying in terms of transferable skills or something that's related. Um, okay, uh, next question here. Have you seen an increase in organizations performing, performing hiring freezes due to the, you know, pandemic? We have absolutely in full transparency. However, we've been told by a majority of these, if not all of these companies, it's not a matter of if the rules will go back um, to being active, it's just a matter of when. Things are changing each and every single day. Um, so yes, there are certainly fewer jobs we're working on now. However, we do still have 25, is that right? Yeah, we have about 25 um, jobs that we're working on, so that's pretty cool. Um, we get new jobs in, and we're, we're getting new jobs in every week. You know, we're having more and more come in, so I think that's certainly good news. Um, mm -hmm. I think it just depends on the company and what they do and, and the function of them. You know, if it's a retail company or hospitality, absolutely, this is definitely uh, a, a tough time for those industries. Um, but we do still have many clients who are operating really business as usual. So I think it just depends on the industry and the company specifically. Um, and also I think as we kind of progress in this, um, we get more information and we get kind of more, um, you know, more insight as to how we can proceed. Um, and and companies are also working on their onboarding processes virtually because they think part of it is companies want to make sure that their new hires have a good experience being onboarded and that the employee experience is important so sometimes companies are holding off on hiring until they can really formalize those processes and make them positive so that new hires coming on board although they're going to be sitting at a computer you know not in the office they still feel like part of the team um, someone's asking, <clears throat> you just you don't do internships, correct? I, I assume not. Yeah, I didn't think so. But um, someone was just asking, is, is this a good time to look for an internship? And I would just say my career services hat on is to say, yes, um, I know of people who are looking to for interns for the fall and um, some maybe even in the summer. And you don't know who's looking for what when. It's kind of uneven. Like you're saying, you have 25 positions, you know, available. So I would say keep looking because at the point they're ready, which is whether it's next week or two months from now, you want to be in there, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, you want to be in there, uh, in their, uh, their front door. You want to be there in their pool of people. That's the word, pool of people. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So um, is being an older candidate a problem? Absolutely not. No, I think, you know, being an HR, especially, um, and I'll let Sylvia and Julia also pop in here. Um, but I mean, we work on jobs, honestly, all the time where candidates sometimes have been overlooked because they omit some experience on their resume, where it looks like they have less experience than they actually do. And our clients want candidates with more experience. So I think you want to work at a place 
that is inclusive um, of, you know, from a diversity and inclusion perspective, it is inclusive of everyone, um, including age and a company that's going to not hire you because of that is number one, breaking the law, but also not a place that I would want to work personally. Um, and I don't think a place that you would want to target anyway. So it's absolutely not a problem at all. Um, and I'm sorry if, if the person asking that question has been told that it is because that's absolutely not true. Yeah, agreed uh, with Olivia for sure. I mean, it, it, you just said she hit everything on the nail there. It's not the right organization if you're being overlooked for that reason. And it is more of a multi-generational work environment than ever before. Um, so it's not, uh, it might, it's not as weird as it might have been some years ago or whatever, a decade ago, but it's definitely a multi-generational work environment, just to add. So this is for Julia. How did you navigate going from a sales management role to an HR role? What steps did you take to bolster your resume and get a foot in the door as you worked on your career change? Yeah, so I think from a resume perspective, kind of what Sylvie said, I mean, I didn't have a formal HR title, but I did some HR work, for example, recruiting high Oh, I think your computer froze. Oh, you're back. Back? Okay, I don't have the best Wi-Fi, so um, sorry, guys, as I'm sure everyone can deal with this, too. Um, but so, you know, I, I didn't have the formal title, per se, um, and I highlighted anything that I did from an HR perspective. So if I'm having performance conversations, if I'm coaching um, leaders on how to have conversations with employees, um, dealing with employee relations issues and taking partners um, with the HR managers about it. Um, so I made sure I highlighted that. Um, and I think I use, I don't know how many of you guys have used agencies or have partnered with agencies in the past, but I think for me, it was doing my research and tapping into my network as well um, of who I can partner with that can help and be consultative in terms of my career path and how I can pivot into HR because I didn't know how. I mean, I started with Target as an intern and I worked with them for a few years. So I was very jaded in terms of what's next and how can I get there. Um, and so just being transparent with the recruiter that I met with, I've actually met with a recruiter in another um, division as well as a colleague of mine who wasn't able to be present, but um, having those transparent conversations with them about what it is that I'm looking for and what I want and also being honest if I didn't know, right? Um, there was so much I didn't know about HR. Um, and so they kind of guided me through that and I was able to do my own research about the industry um, from an HR standpoint. So I think that's also important as you kind of look and what's next for you. And on my onboarding experience, I think is just taking everything in as a sponge and doing my own research outside of work. So yes, there was the relevant training that I did and I have some great peers and some great colleagues who, and a great boss that has really helped and supported me. But you know, I've had to do some research on my own, readings on my own to really understand um, you know, HR as a whole um, and the different functions. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Are there special certifications that you could recommend for professionals that want to go into organizational development or talent management? No? I'm not, truthfully, I'm not aware of any off the top of my head. I know that they exist. Many colleges that have master's programs offer certificate programs. Um, I've seen candidates who have it on their resume. And um, I think they're, you know, they're in the area, they're locals to the tri-state area. Um, I would say what's most important for us when we're looking at our candidates, it has to do with someone's experience and what they've actually done in the field. Um, if you're in a position within an organization that maybe isn't HR related, but you've built strong relationships with the HR department, maybe you can spend a day shadowing or you can you know, try to work on projects or you could try to move internally where you've already built that credibility. Um, 
So yeah, I know that they exist in kind of a long-winded way of answering the question, but not really. Um, I would suggest just looking up, um, you know, the the schools in the area that have master's programs, they likely have certificate programs as well. And you have, and I think you mentioned already, you have entry level positions. So but let's say someone's graduating with their master's, they might not have exact um, experience in HR, but you have those positions, correct? Yeah. And um, a lot of the times our administrative teams may have some roles that are entry level that have some of that HR, if someone that maybe doesn't have internship, HR internships or an administrative job as they were working um, throughout their graduate program. Um, I know I've seen that a lot as well. And that kind of helps you put your foot in the door because you touch up on some of that HR function. So we, we do at times get um, cross-functional jobs as well with our admin team. Um, somebody wants to know how can they leverage their strong research skills to get into HR? I saw Jasmine had written back um, HR yes. analytics or consulting. Um, I do think certainly, I mean, at least from the rules I've seen, we don't, we work on some consultant roles, but I would say we definitely work more so on the HR analytics types of positions. So I would say someone who is really tech savvy and good, good with numbers, good with data, um, that could be kind of a natural transition. I would say probably the biggest hurdle you would have is perhaps not using the programs. Um, you know, the analytics programs that are specific to HR, but if you're finding when you're looking at descriptions for a job that you maybe haven't used a program, there are many ways that you can get familiar with it um, that are free, you know, YouTube and honestly just Googling, um, you know, free tutorial in, I don't know, Tableau or in SQL or something like that. Um, you know, if you're looking at a really technical job can be helpful to just help you brush up on it. Um, so I would say probably roles like that, or maybe even more HR operational roles um, would be helpful. And you wanna make sure that you're highlighting that quantitative experience you've had in research on your resume. Okay, um, so when you have a lot of experience, but they're in different industries, should you include those that are not related on your resume? How do you explain it at an interview? And how would you put that on your how would you put that on your resume? So it's kind of three parts there. Yeah. So I think um, this question could be taken two different ways. So the first way I read it is that maybe this person has had a, a lot of HR positions in different industries. The other way I could see it is if you've you've actually held a variety of different kinds of roles in different industries that way too. So this will kind of answer both. Um, first of all, it's great to have a variety of industry experience. Um, you know, while some companies maybe, for example, say a tech company would love someone who's been with a tech company before, um, we, we do see that clients do appreciate someone that has been adaptable and flexible and has had the experience in different industries that can really show kind of who you are and your, your adaptability. So I definitely wouldn't hide that or eliminate it from your resume. Um, you know, I think explaining that during an interview Again, I would, I would emphasize that you're an adaptable, flexible person. You like trying new things. Maybe you wanted to gain a new challenge and you decided to make an industry change or, you know, kind of being able to walk through why you made those decisions and, and how you were able to adapt in each industry. Um, and then how for that specific role, how that will relate to this and how you can adapt and do well in this position or if it's a new industry then too. Um, and again, I, I would definitely include it on your resume um, I think, you know, whether it is different positions you're talking about or specifically in HR in different industries, I think it's great to just be honest with employers. And again, I think it is, you know, a, a skill to, to be in different industries and have that ability. So, yeah. And one thing I want to include is that when you're putting it in your resume, similar to what Sylvie said in the presentation of like size and scope, especially if it's a company that we it, it's not a big organization maybe like a an american express that's so well known um including the industry there so i don't know if it's let's say i i can't think of anything on the top of my head but 
you know, it's um, Tomato is a, you know, tech company that has 600 employees um, focused in life sciences, software, I don't know, anything of that nature. And you could do so as such if you go into a creative industry after that and you supported maybe 30 employees um, and doing so as much. So just to paint the picture overall to kind of understand that. All right, so we have two more here. Um, what recommendation would you make uh, to breaking into employee relations? Are there roles that organizations are looking for when hiring for ER roles? So with employee relations, I would say if you've been, I mean, it's, it's hard to answer specifically to, to you, Matt, because I don't have your resume in front of me. However, if you are a business partner, for example, and you've done employee relations, you want to make sure that you list the employee relations experience um, and the extent to which you've handled employee relations cases investigations you know handling the full scope of the process um, if you've done pieces of employee relations in other jobs just make sure you're making those parallels you're making it very clear and easy for someone who's reading your resume to make that connection so you don't want to make it difficult for someone to make the connection you want to make it clear as day what you've done that is employee relations focused. Um, there's also labor relations that can be a part of, um, of employee relations. So if that's something that you've done there, just including that as well in your resume. Um, so yeah, I would say if we have an employee relations specialist, someone who's maybe sat in um, an ER focused team at a larger company, where they're just handling employee relations and nothing else, um, but I think it's also possible if you just happen to be in, a, in an employee relations heavy position, but that wasn't your title, just make that clear on your resume. It looks like we have one last question. Um, so if you are in operations management and have done HR functions, you think it will be challenging to get a mid senior level position since you don't have the HR title on your resume. So I think, first of all, if, you know, to get a mid, it depends on the role, it depends on the company, right? I think when, you know, there's definitely, first of all, on your resume, I would definitely, as we've talked about, having the, the HR relevant experience on there and making that clear that although maybe you haven't had an HR title, you have had, had experience with aspects of HR. Um, I would definitely emphasize that. And again, I think it depends on the role um, you know, there's definitely certain positions, certain companies that, you know, if they're, they're open to seeing candidates who maybe have different kinds of skill sets and have had some exposure to HR. So, you know, in terms of a mid senior level position, it's hard for me to say yes or no to if it's hard. I think it depends. Um, but making those changes to your resume, having that be emphasized um, will definitely help. And then again, working with an agency recruiter. Um, you know, we're able to voice what you have done and, and really express that to a client. So that can also be very helpful would be, you know, to work with a recruiter on your behalf. Um, okay, I think we actually got to everybody. When does that ever happen? <laughs> um, are there any final comments that any of you would like to make before I let people know the next info session what's happening? I was just going to say um, thank you so much to everybody. Um, I think this was this is a lot of fun, and I hope that we were able to help um, in some way. And also during this time, I think all of us, our whole team, we're open to just talking to anybody. We just want to get to connect with you guys, um, help in any way we can, whether it's helping you get a job or not. We just want to help. Resume, whatever it might be, feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you guys for taking the time. I hope you guys are all staying healthy and safe. And like Sophie said, you know, we're open to just having conversations and seeing how we can help. And, you know, we have a whole network of, of people that we know and, you know, any way that we're able to help in any way of resume or thinking of some very unique networking tips for you, we'd be open to do that as well. Yes. And thank you again, everyone. Really, really appreciate you all being here and taking the time out of your days to spend it with us. Thank you so much to Elise and Maria for helping to organize this. Nice. This was 
a lot of fun. Honestly, we love doing this. So we would be more than happy to do it again if you guys would like. Um, and yeah, as, as Julia and Sylvie have said, I will reiterate, we are here to be a resource and you know, this is what we love to do. So please feel free to reach out. Please connect with us on LinkedIn and hopefully we can talk to you all very soon. Hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Keep washing your hands, stay inside. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Uh, before we go, I just first want to just thank Sylvia, Olivia, and Julia so much for giving your time. This is at a critical period uh, for everybody in terms of, you know, what to do in terms of job hunting um, So and the preparation for it. So really, thank you so much for that. And I just want to let everybody know that tomorrow we have um, another information session at 5 o'clock. Um, actually about consulting, how to start your own consulting business and what is consulting looking like during COVID-19 um, by somebody who works at um, this ATD, uh, Talent Metrics. So that's tomorrow at five. And uh, again, yes, thanks everybody for being on. Thank you. And this, the staff from Beacon Hill, thank all the students. Stay safe and we hope to see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Ciao. Good night. Stay safe and healthy. Bye.